Hello, and welcome to Cheap Scares, a horror podcast that will travel the six paths of enlightenment. I am your host, Sybil Arnett, and with me is... Hi, I am David Schneider. And this week, we are going to go as far from Saw 4 as you possibly can with Jigoku, the Sinners of Hell. But uh, yes, this week will be Nobuo Nakagawa's Jigoku, a wonderfully artistic, religious, dreamlike film that was the final production of Shintoho Pictures, the union led spin-off of Toho that would die within a little over a decade after its founding. This was their final work, and they got to go all out in the finale, with everyone in the studio participating, sets being allowed to get a little wild because they didn't have to reuse them anymore, and oh so much flame. Yeah, it, um, it definitely, th- finding out after watching the movie that this was just like, this, this is probably the end, the last thing we're ever going to make. So let's just go for it. We're using everything. We're using everyone. That makes a lot more sense now. Yep. That's how you go from uh, a relatively tight cast up until the final yeah. act. It is a movie that just kind of keeps expanding and never stops. Mm-hmm. So I have not seen a whole lot of Japanese films from this era, like, at all. Uh, mm-hmm. I think, I, as far as I'm aware, this is the second oldest uh, Japanese film I've ever seen. Uh, you can probably guess the first, the, the number one oldest. There's, like, three good choices, and it's one of those. I'm gonna guess Seven Samurai. That was it. That was it. The other, the other choices being Rashomon and Godzilla. I didn't even think of Godzilla, but you're right. I find that, like, movies from this era, the evolution of, like, filmmaking, I am no film scholar, no, uh, or n- nor a movie maker, but but there's there's things that you notice over time, like, uh, people start figuring out, like, th- th- this is how you set things up in the frame in order to convey this mood, mm-hmm. and... Like, obviously, there's, like, the early successes, like, Citizen Kane it really just nailed a whole, like, a whole bunch of things that nobody else had to that point. But um, they were, st- they were still a lot of, like, experimentation going through the years. Uh, and I find, like, the early 60s is kind of a weird one. I, I would say that it, it all kind of came together into what we would more or less recognize as modern modern movie making around like the 70s that's reasonable Uh, that's that's about when they really just found okay this all works and it will make us money and it just kind of exploded from there um not to say that there are not still experimental films or anything like that but uh as information just sort of got out there just the, the the process of how to make a movie like you'll you still notice you still feel it mm-hmm. and stuff from like the early 60s you really don't know which end you're gonna get and this kind of this kind of started like uh a a more similar structure to what we see nowadays and just kind of well, we'll we'll get there, but it kind of just went off in another direction entirely and never came back. It did. I confess, there is a second secret reason I chose this one for you and I, and okay. it's because 
I don't think you would find it something that needs to be hidden to say that we both read incredibly soap opera comic Mary Worth, and this is what the world of Mary <laughs> Worth would look like if Mary died. If 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 kind of anybody died? Well, if there was no Mary <laughs> as a grounding cosmic force for those people, this sense of escalation would be what comes of it. Yeah, yeah, now that I think about it, especially like the second act of of uh the whole thing, you're you're dead on on that one. The, the old so. folks home and everything turning into sins upon sins. Oh yeah. The, as as we as we discover that we are all the sinners of hell. That was the uh, title of the film in western release, I believe, for a while. They like you can't just put a Japanese word on on a, a poster in 1960 that's weird we're calling it the sinners of hell we we can't just call it hell which is what it means i think until criterion put this out in recent years it was not here as anything but the sinners of hell on budget vhs's and midnight movies yeah it was i i can imagine um that that's a like um the transfer i i watched it on the criterion channel and it looked pretty good they Criterion is an interesting company. Uh, I have the Blu-ray from them, so similar. I never really knew about Criterion for a while. Like, I never had a Laserdisc player. So it was they were just kind of off in a different world from me. And so I didn't really hear about them until uh, the DVD. They start. I didn't, I didn't hear about them until, like, they started releasing movies on DVD. And uh, I, I was... Some somehow until recently the knowledge of the laser disc thing just never entered my brain, but that's a totally different point. They did a really good job of just like carving a niche out for themselves as we are the home video company for serious film buffs. If you like capital F film, <laughs> look look through our catalog. We got it. And, and if you want their dark mirror, look up Arrow. It's not something that I think would work out as well to carve out a brand nowadays. Like, you see a thousand streaming services just trying to do. It's not a niche that's, like, easy to make a profit from. And so I'm pretty impressed that they managed to just do it so well that they just create very high-quality releases of the, their terminology is important films, which is kind of weaselly. Oh, yeah. That allows them to do their strategy of, we will do very obscure art house cinema or things we think need to be kept alive from directors of import, and then we will throw out one relatively big name thing for the common <laughs> folk that they can go, this is the definitive edition. I'm rebuying uncut gems from them in a month because, shit, it's a really good transfer. Yeah, I I believe when I first heard about them, it was about, like, number 75. And so looking back, looking at, they, they number all their releases and they started over for when they went to DVD. Mm -hmm. um, I looked at that and, it, like, number 75, it's Chasing Amy. I'm like, oh, okay, that was probably it. That was one of them. Uh, they also did The Rock... Um, I have that on DVD still. Yep. Yeah. I uh, I did see that their last Laserdisc was Armageddon. Yes. I don't know if they did a DVD version of that. For some reason, I just didn't want to own Armageddon, even if the Criterion Collection put it out. <laughs> but yeah, this this movie was interesting. I It very cleanly cuts itself into three acts, mm -hmm. like incredibly cleanly. <laughs> I really liked the first act. Uh, the second one kind of started to lose me, and the ending is... Mm -hmm. It was the thing that I... It, it, it's, a... it's obviously the bullet point. If you look up anything about this movie, it's like, they're gonna go to hell. <laughs> so yep. it's not exactly a spoiler that they go to hell. Or were they already in hell? I'm willing to bet, as you were watching this, there was a part of you going, why are we doing this for a horror show until that <laughs> final act? No, not really. Okay. I, it was it was a very noticeable, like, 
Uh, there, there were definitely enough weird things that they sort of sprinkled in through the whole movie. Like, um, there, uh, there's one part where he just walks, uh, one of the characters walks up and just goes, by the way, your clock is stopped and it stopped at exactly nine o'clock. I'm like, that's weird. Just a whole bunch of stuff like that. And like within 10 minutes, I was just thinking, okay, yeah, we're already in hell probably. <laughs> they'll they'll probably go back and say this was hell the whole time the real world it is hell which was very deep the first time uh i came across that concept and then i found out it was re like really like a common story beat but they didn't really do that they just kept it completely ambiguous as it turns out yeah it it builds towards what you think is one thing and then there's that rug pull Mm -hmm. <clears throat> which is uh, again not as big of a rug pull when it's been 60 years and it's the thing that everybody knows th about the movie Fair. so I'm, I'm sure if you were going to the japanese cinema in 1960 you were probably blown away or i didn't think not. to watch the trailer on the disc that's i should have checked blown away or nauseous <laughs> Definitely possible on that last one. So let's kick off here, and I'm going to try and put things chronologically because the film sort of plays around with time and places and it makes it very muddled. Mm -hmm. So a day before the film starts, uh, a young man named... Shiro Shimizu, and I'll probably stick with Shiro on that, but he is referred to as both for a while. Yeah, uh, they, is... they don't they don't actually say Shiro until quite a ways into the movie. I think it's at the second act, because yeah, all the other students call him Shimizu san, and then he's Shiro among the elderly. Yep. But for simplicity's sake, you only need to learn one name, Shiro. <laughs> Which means white. Yes. Which is ironic for a lot of reasons, although it is generally what he is wearing. He's got sort of a um, college student, white top, black pants, slacks combo. Uh, with the black jacket, of course, with the uh, the high collar. A look I am recently familiar with because of the, grace, the great Ace Attorney. The main character is just dressed like that. And so I, I look at that and now I know, oh... Japanese college students. And so he is going to marry his girlfriend, Yukiko, who is the daughter of his professor. Uh, they. I don't know if they give. Da, 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 da. Uh, Yajima? Yeah, I, I was seeing if he had a first name. I don't think it ever comes up. He's just professor. No. Or the Yajimas are referred to yeah. as the family name. Yeah, I think Yukiko is the only one that gets a first name. Yes. And so. They are there, and that's when his friend Tamara comes in. Oh, boy. <laughs> interrupting this wonderful scene. And Tamara is going ham the entire movie. You never get the sense that he is anything but the worst human being you will see. <laughs> he is amazing, and I love him. He is the if if I if I wanted to become a complete garbage human being, I would hope to be like him. He does pull uh, it, it off is... to a degree you cannot do without practice. Yeah, he he ha he make he makes some really incredible faces. Pretty much every scene that he's in, I don't think you ever see him walk through a door. No, as he far... usually appears yeah. behind something. <laughs> As far as I can recall, that's all that happens. He's, he's just not in the scene, and then he is. Mm-hmm. Which is what, what, which is a choice. In fact, you first see him not because he's appeared, but shot from behind holding a rose. You just focus on the rose. <laughs> but Tamara comes in just interrupting this wonderful moment between this family throws a picture down in front of the professor going, here, I'm done with this. And it's uh, <laughs> two men in wartime in what appears to be a very miserable shot. And this upsets the professor and his wife. 
And then he's like, you know, I know that you hate letting me in here, which is why I didn't knock, by the way. But I should probably go. <laughs> hey, Shiro, come on with me. Yeah, he, he, he just like barged right on in or uh, teleported or whatever. Uh, he as, as he is leaving, that is when uh, that is when he notes, oh, the clock is stopped. And we get an extreme close up of the clock. It's like the entire frame. Nine o'clock. The fo- the photo uh, is ki- it's kind of hard to see when he first throws it down. We get a better look at that scene later. Um, yep. uh, it wasn't clear that uh, I-, I looked at it and I was just kind of like, is that the professor pictured there? And it is, but it really was not uh, very visible. No, you have no way to tell what it is this early, but it comes up a few times. Yeah, it's, I imagine, especially if you're watching one of those old VHS uh, masters. Yeah. So the two of them are driving home, and Tamara <laughs> throws some money in Shiro's lap and goes, y- you know you're going to need this. I know you're behind on rent. I know you're behind on tuition. You owe me so much. <laughs> and it's, it's so generous. It's so generous. So the thing is, Tamara is king asshole, but he never seems to steer Shiro maliciously. He he steers him selfishly. He never seems to make a move that you can explicitly go, ah, he's leading him further into sin. No, he's already there. He's just saying, stop here, buddy. Stop here. Yeah, he he doesn't really seem to care much about anything or anyone, and he would be, like, totally cool if he and Shiro went off and did some serial killing or something, but he's not going to force it. Yeah, but in so many other stories, this character would just be the tough Bancho who might have a heart of gold. He does not have a heart of gold. No, he... He, we we get a much better look at his organs, and I, there was no golden heart in there. Surly looks out for only <laughs> one person, Tamara. So Shiro goes, "Hey, can we can we take a side route to get home?" And a lot of this movie runs on dream logic. Where, sure, th- it was unnecessary, but it did happen. We will never explain why it happened, <laughs> but it led us to where we need to be, and that is. Tamara running over the leader of a Yakuza, <laughs> Kyoichi. And that man, he is, he, is, he is drunk and he is in the road and he is so drunk and in the road. And it is one of the funniest things I've seen in a while it is just completely over the top. He's just like stumbling and waving around. And, uh, the actual shot of him getting run over is also pretty funny because they like, I don't think they tried to make it look realistic at all. The camera no. just kind of just put, they just kind of push the camera into him and then he just falls. And I don't think we even show the fall. We just suddenly cut to a shot of the back bumper and we see Kyoichi on the ground just going, you've run me over, you bastard. And then he <laughs> expires off screen. And there is blood everywhere. It is like... Like, three cars worth of blood just all over the road. Yeah. Trying to think (laughs) about how he was hit that caused all this and did not destroy the front of the vehicle. Did he go over? Did he go under? (laughs) Whatever. He's in the ground now. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It it happened. That's that's another one of the things where it's kind of filmed, like, in the super weird dreamlike way where... I'm I'm still wondering, like, are we already in hell? And, and Shiro here. is immediately going, we hit that man. We have to stop. And Tamara <laughs> keeps going and just says, you know, this is your fault for asking me to go down that road. <laughs> <laughs> so also a thing that just has no significance, but I, I loved it. It was uh, as they were driving onto the road, there was a big billboard uh just right in the in the center of the frame that says in english hop cola drink 
Have you tried it? <laughs> no punctuation, just have you tried it? I caught have you. I did not look at it in <laughs> detail. That's excellent. It's beautiful. Sorry, go on. Yeah. Um, uh, An old woman who we will later find out is uh, Kyuichi's mother sees this and she does not say anything. She tells the police that night that she didn't see who it was. But we then pick up the next day. Shiro is in class with, you know, professor father-in-law. He is in hell class. <laughs> and they are discussing. Yeah. It is It is the class where you go to learn about hell. This is actually the first scene of the movie, barring a quick bit that we'll probably yeah. return to when we get to the third act, because they reuse the footage there. Yeah, it was, uh, there was a cold open, and then the opening credits uh, featured a bunch of uh, mostly unclad ladies and a really jazzy theme. Yeah, the theme is excellent. It completely does not fit with the rest of the movie at all, but it was catchy. No, uh, I don't think even when we have an actual revelry going on, we get anything that sounds jazzy. It's wild. I I would say most most of the music that I noticed was uh, mostly just people doing kind of uh, sort of like Buddhist chanty stuff, uh, which and uh, almost. Every time that I actually read uh, the lyrics on the screen, it was uh, basically just describing exactly what was happening at the time. Yes, uh, including a hilarious one of those that <laughs> we'll return to. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> it, easily my favorite one of those in the entire film is just narrating the thing that is happening. <laughs> Ominous. <laughs> so, yeah, it's... Uh, a philosophy, maybe religious studies class, discussing the concept of hell through various religions, the way the word evolved to the Japanese term, and Tamara just pops into the class <laughs> He's just right behind Shiro. Hey, man, you're looking, uh, you're looking pretty down. That guy last night's dead, by the way. And that's actually the first sentence you hear anyone but the professor <laughs> speak in this movie. <laughs> yeah, he also threw he also threw a rose at Shiro, like at his book. Well, he still had to have it. Yeah. And uh, I won't call out all of the artistic flourishes in this, but uh, very deep reds are generally just associated with evil and temptation in this film at every level. Uh, yes, there there is one specific. It's mostly pink, really, but uh, there's one specific thing that I noticed that really stood out. Pink it, is generally innocence. Red is uh, temptation. Mm, that fits. Yep. So, yeah, uh, we actually have this bit that starts appearing here with Tamara, another one where... He does sort of teleport around, as you pointed out, but he constantly appears lower and just leading you and everyone deeper. Like, suddenly he's appeared at the bottom of the classroom when everything's ended and Shiro's come out of his daydream. And he's just down at the bottom of these steps playing with the chalkboard where, uh, I forget the first word of hell, history, concept of hell is written. Uh, concepts of hell, yes. Yes. It's uh it's an interesting touch. Um there was a transition between uh Shiro in class and then him in uh Yukiko's living room and it's all one shot and the screen just kind uh, it zooms in really far on him and everything just goes black except for a spotlight on him and then it kind of lingers on that for like a really long time. Uh, and then it just sort of fades in and now we're now we're somewhere else so i would assume they just like changed the entire set during that time i i i you I, it it would have been a lot smoother if it hadn't taken as long but i can't, also can't imagine it not taking that long so they also do a little more with that they zoom in and we're looking over his left shoulder and we zoom out from that tight shot over his right onto the I living see. room. Gotcha. It's an easy way to cover that. But yeah, you're right. It must have been done in one very stage play-like, especially with the lowering the lights. 
Yeah, and a, a lot of the the later stuff in Hell also prop seemed like it. A lot of it seemed like it could have been done it uh, in a stage play or like a, a maybe a toned down version of it. Probably, yeah. So yeah, uh, at this point we have uh, Kyoichi's mother, who does not get named, talking with Yoko, Kyoichi's girlfriend. And the two of them are just having a discussion under the now-established shrine to the dead Kyoichi in their house. His Yakuza life was bringing in the money they were living off of, so they're in kind of a pickle here. And (laughs) Yoko's going... You had to have seen something. She's like, yeah, but, you know, when his dad got run over by a truck, cops didn't do anything with what I saw, so I didn't tell them. Nothing good happens with police. They don't do anything for us. And Yoko decides, well, that's great. You know who it is. We should find them and kill them. And Kyoichi's mother is on board with this, but is also starting to go down the road of, I'm going to die in this process, too. Yeah, Which becomes a running theme. A lot of these scenes take place uh, sort of by the the shrine for the dead person. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, in this case, uh, obviously, her son, Kyoichi. And she does say at one point, I'll be with you soon. Something along those lines. Yeah, Yoko never comments on it, but she's got to have noticed the old woman is constantly talking about, I'm going to join you in hell happily. I also didn't really figure out Yoko's uh relation to him for quite a while it uh they it, I was I'm wondering if it's like just sort of like a a a cultural sort of stereotype thing that I'm just supposed to intuit that they are that they were lovers but I I was just like is is that a sister no nope the translation doesn't bring it up I do wonder if there's not some honorifics that were supposed to tip us off but yeah, yeah. she does eventually state I was his woman. Yeah, I did not notice any, but I'm not that good at Japanese, so. Exactly. It's one of those things where maybe if you pointed out, I could go, oh, okay, but nothing caught my ear. (laughs) And at this point, Tamara is not luring Shiro to a worse path, but Shiro is like, I've got to confess. We've got to talk to the cops. And Tamara's (laughs) just going, that guy was Yakuza. He's not worth the best years of our lives. Come on, (laughs) chill out. Also, by the way, if you turn yourself in, or if you turn me in, you're going down too. Exactly. Yeah. You were in the car just as much as me, buddy. Uh, We're all in this together. (laughs) Come on, uh, chill out. I wrote down the line, it was basically suicide. Which is quite the thing to say about the guy you just ran over. And so, eventually, later that week, Shiro decides to talk to Yukiko, his fiance, about what has happened. And she is just on the verge of saying, and it's pretty obvious if you know any kind of soap opera or plot, hey, guess who's pregnant? <laughs> but... Yeah. Um, also, also in the car, uh, Tamara said something to the effect of, by the way, I think your girlfriend's pregnant. Yes. Because so, he knows everything, because he's basically the devil. And you um, expect them to reveal that, but they never do. He's just a shithead. She also has this pink umbrella, and uh, when he walks into his apartment, she's there, and it is pointed directly at the screen, and she is spinning it. It is a bright pink umbrella or parasol. I'm not sure mm. which. Uh, and... And they do this quite a few times throughout the movie. That was the thing that I mentioned before. Just uh, a, 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 a parasol pointed directly at the screen spinning. It seemed like uh, if I had to interpret it, I would say something like uh, r- representing like an intentionally not uh, observing or processing information around you or something. Just like blo- blocking your blocking yourself from the world. Something like that. I don't know. But, uh, you know, I can buy it. It, given the person who picks it up after we lose <laughs> Yukiko from the cast, I could see that. And so he, he confesses to her and he says, Look, 
I've got to go to the police. I've got to make this right. I've got to do it right now. And it's the middle of the night, but he doesn't care. And she's just going, well, let look, let's take your time. We can walk together. I'll go with you for support. You know, we can we can do this. I love you. But he's insistent that they have to get in a cab. And so he waits and they hail one. This is kind of the start of uh, as you go through the movie, he just keeps on just taking all responsibility for all of the terrible things that happen around him. He just uh, he just assumes he he just goes, this is my fault. I must atone for this, like, regardless of whether it was actually his fault or not. Which it very rarely is. And this one definitely isn't because they <laughs> get in the car and they say about two words after police station, please. And Yukiko goes, you can drive slowly. And I don't know what this guy does, but <laughs> he then proceeds to fling them into a tree in such a way that I think the driver dies. I, we know Yukiko dies. Yeah, it's not clear what happened to the driver, but um, he did t turn into Tamara for a second or like a hallucination of him. And she was like, whoa, but then he was just <laughs> back to normal again and then it crashed. Yeah. And um, uh, yeah. The crash Terrible did taxi. not the crash did not look that bad. But then it no. cuts to a wide shot and it's just the car is totaled and there's blood just all over the windshield. And Yukiko is lying there in the back seat and she's not dead, but then she she like wakes up just long enough to say that she is dying. But otherwise and, uh, she kinda looks fine. I I don't yeah, know. Yeah, she just it's... expires prettily in uh <laughs> Shiro's lap. So, uh, we cut to just, I think it's supposed to be the Yajima family's living room. And the professor is there. Shiro is in pitch darkness. All we see is the professor comes in from a light off screen. Look, this is not your fault. You know, fate happens. These things happen. You cannot blame yourself. You cannot ruin yourself. And then he leaves, and this is when Shiro goes to the club. Uh, he also sees uh, the this this it does come back later, but uh, he also sees Yukiko's mom, and she is she has gone mad with grief in that yes. way that you do in movies, where she's just kind of like uh, just caressing her daughter's kimonos. And uh, I have seen in some writing on this that she is referred to as a fragile woman. And uh, that's that's a polite yeah. way to sum up her arc over this movie. Yeah, it's not really an arc. She just kind of in the one scene, she's nice. And then from this point on, she's just like this. I think this is the only scene where she says anything other than screaming her daughter's name. <laughs> and it is kind of... give me back my daughter. Uh, also, you don't belong here, I wrote down. Right, right. Yes, yeah, the professor is trying to be like, no, look, he was he was yeah, very he's... sweet on the girl, but uh, yeah, Mrs. Yajima he, is not having it. He's trying to be the stoic Japanese man who does not let grief get in the way of being uh, stoic and proper. And uh, that this allows, I guess it just allows her to... I, I really don't can't think of a phrase for it other than goes mad with grief because that is just literally what happens. Oh, yeah. Yeah. She starts carrying around Yukiko's umbrella. And I'm not kidding when I say 99 percent of her dialogue for the rest of the film will be screaming the name Yukiko, no matter the context. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we are at a club where Shiro is getting wrecked and there is a dancer we see <laughs> shot from below she's going at it and nothing is getting this guy out of his sulk yeah this uh, this movie gets horny at really weird times like the uh, it it lingers on the dancer for quite some time as she uh d disrobes down to basically underwear and everyone in this place is wearing crimson with red mm -hmm. lights around. It's not very subtle. No. 
But eventually, Yuko comes up and goes, hey, you want to come back home with me? And Shiro is just drunk enough at this point that, you know what? He does. So, in that case, we also get uh, a little bit of a nightmare sequence where Tamara has given him crap. Oh yeah, that's right. You should suffer. You and your conscience were about to sell me out. You know you earned this. Oh yeah, he's like... it. It The way it's shot, I was having trouble figuring out if we were looking at Shiro or Tamara in in that particular scene having having seen the rest of the movie now it is quite obvious that it, it would only be shiro d- mm-hmm. acting like this at all but um it, the voiceover is tamara during that period so i was really i wasn't sure like i l- like you mentioned the the camera is way below everyone so you, all you can kind of see is like his chin just leaned over in this perma slump until Yuko comes up. Yeah. And so uh, at this point, everything starts wrapping Shiro in this web because, you know, Yoko wakes up first and sees his ID. And we find out later she did not know this was Shiro, but she sees the ID and goes, oh, you. And so she leaves him a note and says, you need to come back to this bar tonight. I gotta see you again. It's great. And he would, except he gets a telegram to the second act of the movie. Your mother's condition is critical. Come immediately from his father. And so he takes the train out of Tokyo. And then we do not see Yoko or uh, the gang leader's mother for quite a while. Yep. Because, yeah, it seems like it would be a hard lead to follow when a guy just up and runs out of town for a while. So, we are now at the Old Age Home. It's uh, it's a mm-hmm. retirement community. Uh, there is a name to it, but... Uh, all, all I wrote down was Old Age Home. Yeah, that's what's written on the sign, <laughs> also in English. They they do name it eventually, but I don't... Re- re- I do not recall... Yeah, it comes up when they have the 10th anniversary. This place is only 10 years old and already so run down. Yeah, it's a, it seems like a really awful place to live. Um, there's two buildings. Well, there's three buildings. One is just like a storehouse, which we will have a scene in later. Um, mm-hmm. The actual old folks home, which appears to just be one giant room, pretty much. And, and then it looks uh, like some nooks for beds. Yeah. Yeah. It's just it, we we've just crammed them all in here. And this is just where this is just where you will live for the rest of your life. Um, And the third building is sort of like uh, it seems like an, uh, an apartment building for like the management, basically. Yeah. the Sort of an admin office, because that's where all the people in charge are at. And so we are greeted by Kinuko, who might be a nurse. She's young, probably a little older than Shiro, but she's very flirty, very peppy, incredibly shameless. Oh boy. She she is quite forward. Yup. And we then meet uh, Ito, Shiro's mother, who she's, you know, just down on the ground, not doing much in bed, and... A room away is like, hey, where's dad? How are, How is he doing? We can hear Gozo, his father, and Kinuko just absolutely having just shy of sex, flirting, playing around with each other through the walls. It, it seemed like just like maybe just after they finished. Yeah, it's on the verge, if not there. We never see anyone having sex in this movie, but we see a lot of things that are definitely meant to imply you were on there. You were just about to. Most of them involving Kinoko. (laughs) And so while this is going on, you know, uh, Ito is blaming herself because, you know, she's... Ito is, while she is depicted later as a sinner for some obvious reasons generally a good person and so she's taking this burden on you oh he wouldn't be doing that if i were in better health this is my fault 
yeah, it's clear. It's clear where uh, Shiro got it from. Yeah. But uh, their neighbor's daughter, Sachiko, comes in and she is a dead ringer for Yukiko because she's the same actress. They do eventually have uh, Tamara later say, wow, she looks just like Yukiko. I'm like, oh, thank God. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, uh, she wanders in and she is the daughter of the man who lives in the next door to the Shimizus in the complex, which is Ensai, who is an old painter with a checkered past. Yes, and he is painting some sinners in hell. Yep, for the temple is all we ever hear. But it's yep. a it's a wonderful piece that we see him working on in very passionate methods over the course of this film. Yeah, he he seems uh, a bit mentally disabled, and so the. It, it it's hard to tell if they were going for that or if it was just like this is what artists do. Um, he's supposed to be represented as incredibly alcoholic, right? He drank himself to ruin and ended up here. Is yeah, was a line. But and it's I can definitely see how you would get that read because at one point he's just reaching into a pot of paint and dragging his hand along the canvas to make flames. Which is very effective. Oh, it's a great scene, but just out of the blue, it's like, is that how you work all the time? Okay. Now I'm kind of wondering (laughs) if the actor was actually an artist. Um, The Ensai Taniguchi? Yes, you need Jun Otomo. Uh, No information. Got it. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, this... This is another one of those things where uh, I wish I were a little better with Japanese just to follow some of the research on these things, because movies like this don't have a lot of easy ways to track the cast in the West. Yeah, especially like movies that just kind of came out and then just just kind of were ignored for like 40 years. Mm hmm. But at this point, we should probably set the stage with the. the cast of characters who are running yeah. this old folks home. So yeah, th- this part of the movie just starts introducing so many more characters because mm-hmm. it's, it's like four or five people in the first part. And then they come here and it's just like, Oh, here's the detective. Here's the doctor. Here's uh, a, a, another woman who's like kind of like, like maybe Sachiko's mom, I think just kind of weirdly flirty. Uh, the journalist. There, yeah. was a, there was a journalist eventually. <laughs> so, um, Gozo, uh, Shiro's father, runs this place. He is the one in charge. Then there's Kinuko, who is kind of a nurse, but just blatantly his mistress. There is the doctor, Kusama, who sucks. He's very um, bad. Akagawa, who is the journalist with uh, with some checkered stuff and... He and the detective are both sort of giving Ansai shit and going, hey, you know, you should uh, you should do something for me because uh, we both know you got a past. You got a history. And they're trying to get their hands on Sachiko. Uh, your daughter, your daughter's hand in marriage would be a good way to not go to jail. Yeah, he, tr- he kind of tries to uh, the, the thing with the blackmail is it just doesn't work like he doesn't care. He doesn't. He he's pretty pretty much sure that he's not. This guy is not going to send him to jail. So no, I am not going to sell you my daughter. Yeah, and later on we will also see uh, a fisherman who is also in cahoots with this crew. But yeah, I thought I thought he was one of the residents. <laughs> it's I I thought he was one of those, but he 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 does work there. Yeah, he's more in line with the staff, and everyone on the staff is just a real terrible person. So, uh, yeah, we have the the whole blackmail thing. We've seen the painting. Uh, at this point, we have the statement by one of the people who is dying. There's an old man who I don't know if he gets named. He will eventually be dead, but he's talking about, ah, you're just skimming off the top of our welfare and... 
this food's terrible, we can barely live on it. And Gozo's claiming, oh, no, no, no. This costs 62 yen a day, and your payment, no. or this... They, they receive 62 yen a day and are spending 70, so you should be grateful. Yes, absolutely. Which, that seems like, like, even whenever this movie is set, that seems really low for the number of people they're trying to feed. And is very clearly not true, we'll find out. Well, yeah. But yeah, uh, so at this point, uh, Shiro has gone from just this whole thing that happened in Tokyo, and now he finds out his family, he's about to lose his mother, and this whole place is falling apart. And so he's just walking alongside train tracks, wanting to die. <laughs> Several of the people in the old age home, like, uh, uh, what was, what was her name? Kinako, uh, mm -hmm. and like maybe a couple of, uh, the staff, they they tend to talk about going back to Tokyo as, like, their ultimate dream or whatever. Like, this is th this is what, what I need to do to move on with my life. But they're, nev they're never going to because the, it, it is the end of the line. Yeah. So yeah. I'm uh, waving my Kinuko hands around. especially is hoping to hitch her star to Shiro and just get out of here. But no, the, at this point, uh, I just, uh, yeah, I just bring bring it up because they very specifically say that in such a way that it's just obviously just more symbolism, just, you know, getting getting out of my life. It doesn't have to be Tokyo, but it just is. Yeah. Just like anywhere city. else, anywhere else would be better. And so uh, at this point. Uh, Sachiko is sort of taking a liking to him because he's, you know, her age. He's very polite. And she she wants to spend some time with him. She's not going, yeah, I got to go back to the city with you. And she's like, hey, while you're here, we could spend some time. We could take a walk. And Kinako is attaching herself to this boy. <laughs> he's being like, no, no, you, you should, you absolutely need to know that he's in love with me, aren't you, Shiro? Come on, say it. Who would you pick, Shiro? Very desperate. But it's enough to cause a wedge between the two, and, you know, as they're on the tracks, this is where Tamara reappears in <laughs> blood red, just right behind the two of them. Uh, he basically has this outfit for the rest of the movie. Um, it's sort of casual clothes with a button up shirt. And just as the movie goes on, it just keeps getting more and more and more open. Yup. And so he calls out, yeah, spitting image of Yukiko, huh? It's uh, great. Well, I'm going to stick around. I'm going to be at the inn nearby <laughs> if you need me. I'm here now. Yep. Better not turn me in. Yep. Uh, I got out of town too. Yeah, I don't think he actually says that part, but it's pretty clearly implied. And yeah, he he got out of town because we will see through some newspaper headlines over the course of things. Oh yeah, they uh, they turned out they start figuring out who it is. The police are looking into the hit and run case, no matter what, uh, <laughs> no matter what the Yakuza mother thinks. But Shimizu's I, can, mother, you can understand why she would think that. They, I, oh they, yeah, <laughs> they definitely uh, set that up. And so Shiru's mother dies and within seconds of this <laughs> kinuko is throwing herself on the boy and this is where as you said yeah you've you've got to take me to tokyo i need to get out of here you're going back soon right take me with you come on and uh yeah the move for some reason the professor and Miss Yajima come out to this old folks' home during this part. They're holding the tenth anniversary thing. I believe they uh, that is when they come by. I would I would assume to check on or just talk to Shiro or just because he's there and they have nothing else now. Something maybe like they're that. family friends with the Shimizu family. Uh, it's, yeah, it's it's entirely possible. Like, the, the, we we don't really get a whole lot of uh, 
his relationship with Yukiko. Mm -hmm. We don't we don't really see a lot of details. They just they are young and in love. But bringing Sachiko around to the apartment they're staying in is pretty fucked up. And because, uh, uh, she she's uh, she's also got uh, her daughter's parasol, another pink parasol. Which also was how Sachiko was introduced. That was uh, that was uh, the first thing we saw of her was her parasol. So you know. Yep. I'm gonna keep bringing this up because it's the one thing that I did notice. No, no, that's fine. They'll be harping on it until the final shot of the film. <laughs> and uh, at this point, Miss Yajima just starts caressing the girl and going, Yukiko! <laughs> Yukiko! Oh, it's Yukiko. <laughs> For what it's worth, Sachiko is just like, uh, what do I yeah. say here? I, I wrote, Sachiko seems annoyed. <laughs> like, she's not particularly upset by it. She just kind of wants to be somewhere else. Yeah. We go from this to there's there's a whole thing in the I sort of wrote it down as the staff building at the old folks home. And it's everyone who's not a resident of the place is in here. And wouldn't you know it, who appears from behind a door frame? It's Tamara. Yay. And he just starts going around the room talking about. Sinner, sinner, none of you are free of sin. He's not afraid to say the tough things. He starts off by saying, uh, hey, Doc, turns out you murdered, <laughs> you murdered <laughs> Ito with your shit diagnosis because you didn't want to get a second opinion and you're terrible at your job. And he, he and says he, you knew it was wrong. Yeah. But, but you still didn't want to do the right thing. And so he just starts going around the room talking about everyone's differences and before he can get to the professors which has come up a couple of times he mentions uh i'm trying to find in my notes where the name is he mentions some conflict during the war that he was involved in but malaya okay cool so we have let's see here uh, this is the part where we find out Ensai kicks off the whole thing because he's pissed at Gozo because when before the two of them met, Ensai and Ito were lovers. But then she got with Gozo and had Shiro and all that. This is the first time we hear of this, by the way. Yes. And, you know, in the aftermath of the death when the husband has a mistress on his arm, it's probably the time you would get pissed and bring that up. Yeah. And but, he brings something else up, which is a sword. Yup. And Sachiko starts cleaning it for a minute before Tamaro wanders in and starts his bit. And then he starts pointing around the room with it. And it's like, why did you give Tamara a sword? You can't keep it from him. Sachiko, you really are an innocent. Why would you do that? This man screams bad news. But he starts talking about, oh, yeah, the doctor is uh, complicit in Ito's death. Mr. Yajima was, you know, in the war. We find out later. We'll have more on that. Uh, the detective and the journalist both put innocent men in harm's way to chase down something that furthered their own career. And they both meant to make it right, but oh no, both of those men had died by the time they had done anything. It's terrible. Oh, it's like oh, it's like everybody here has a, a major sin. Mm -hmm. What a coincidence. But before we could go any further with this, we are interrupted by a messenger who is saying that the old man from earlier is dead. But who cares? It's the anniversary festival now. <laughs> yeah, they just really brush that aside immediately. <laughs> Yep. And everyone is coming into town, including the family of Kiyoichi, who are just chanting by a river, uh, where we see a fisherman scooping clearly dead fish. Yes, they are. They are all already dead. Uh, at this point, I just started writing gang women in the, <laughs> uh, in the notes. I like it. 
And uh, ch- the the song that she is singing is about how she's going to die soon. Yes, she will join her son in the afterlife. And again, Yoko, Yoko not giving any response to this. Just like, eh, okay, sure. We we will we will learn a little bit more about her motivations in a future scene. Mm-hmm. And it's a it's probably it's what you probably think. Yep. So the the fisherman, you know, we see him scooping dead fish in the river, and they are not doing anything. He just dumps them out in the admin buildings. Like, <laughs> hey, guess what? They're not rancid yet, and they're incredibly cheap. Everyone wins, and. All the admin staff are just laughing over this. Yeah, the doctor kind of puts up a little bit of a front, like, uh, did, I don't know, it's food poisoning risk. And then it's like, we don't need a scandal in the middle of the festival. And then the line that I wrote down was from uh, uh, Shiro's dad, who just says, who cares? They're for the old folks, not us. And then that's when they start just laughing uproariously because, oh my gosh, <laughs> the Everyone. old folks. And at this point, Shiro is now caught between three women, Yoko, Kinuko, and Sachiko, because Yoko has slipped a note to him that says, meet me on the rope bridge. I cannot go without you. I have to see you. I've come all this way. The rope bridge over the gorge. Yep. I love this shot because we don't watch him walk out onto the bridge from behind, from the side of the river. The camera is above the end of the bridge, following him, turning the whole way. So it's a reverse, a descent down onto the bridge. Yeah, and by by the time he passes the camera, it's uh, it's upside down, and it yep. is. I I actually got a little dizzy. But it's all one steady shot. It, I imagine that rigging that up on a bridge in a way that you could watch it, probably a bit of a nightmare to put together. Yeah, they went for it. It's if you're if you're not gonna go for it now, then when are you really? Mm-hmm. And so Yuko, while she's got or Yoko, while she's got him on a bridge, completely alone, tells him, "Yeah, I know who you are, and I know that you're one of the people who killed my boyfriend." And then she draws a gun, and says, "I was in love with you until I found out who you were, but." Now I have to do my job. And she takes one step. And the first time I saw this, I thought she was wearing heels. But no, she just takes the unluckiest step in the world (laughs) in flats and completely tumbles over the side of this bridge. And she hits the gorge on the way down. Their mannequin bounces a few times. It's very funny. Mm -hmm. But it's... It's one of the funniest... uh dropping uh mannequin shots i've ever seen um yeah it's it, it's also kind of weird because um like when when you see the bridge the the ropes on the side you know to pre- prevent this from happening they're very high so it's yeah. extremely unlikely that she actually would have tripped and falled it tri- falled tripped and fell in that way yeah if a heel broke, maybe, but no, I, I rewatching it, I found out she's wearing flats. Yeah. It's not like anything snapped. I yeah, don't just, know what sent her over the end. The heel just catches on the bridge and it stays there and she goes. Yep. And so Shiro is just looking down at a gun and a shoe left on the bridge and he picks up the gun. And as he stands up, that's when Tamara appears and... This is the only time we see him enter because he does the same descent shot that uh, Shiro did to get on here. So he's like, oh, yeah, I knew this would happen. I know everything, you know. (laughs) And uh, now Tamra does say, and this is another one of those things that you could you could read a few ways, but he just goes, look, stick with me and you'll be fine. He does not say. I'll hold this over you. He does not say, I'll tell everyone. He's just like, look, I'll get you out of this. Yeah, he's a really good friend. He's just, just also, also the things that he does are just like super weird and evil. 
But but, but this, he's uh, he yeah. he is uh you know he is tempting uh, Shiro not with uh, not with riches or anything just like you know it, it's pretty cool over here it's a, I, I I'm happy wouldn't you like to be happy come on mm-hmm. but he does not end the two fight over the gun with <laughs> uh with Tamura getting shot and dragging it down into the gorge but he hits the water. It's a cleaner fall. Yeah, he. I. I think. It, d- didn't he take the like end up with the gun after he got shot? Yeah, I think yeah. he's holding for it to try and like keep his grasp, but no, it. It. Shiro just lets go. So now he doesn't even have the gun; just a shoe. Yep. Sorry, but <laughs> unlike Yoko, he does start screaming, "Tamara!" Well, yeah, I this mean, this is the one that gets him. It's it's the woman that he slept with once on the worst day of his life. It's he's he's not gonna have that much attachment to her. I suppose. And he was still he was kind of in shock, but yeah, it's uh, two more deaths that are not really his fault, but he's gonna he's gonna take that responsibility anyway. Yep. And so we cut from this to the revelry. There is a feast that night. A feast of fish. And among the people who live here, everyone is attending except Ansai, the painter. He's just sitting in his room. And in the admin building, uh, we see that uh, Gozo's second mistress, who runs an inn in town, has donated a bunch of pork that is presumably supposed to be for everyone, but they've just saved it for themselves so they can really pig out. So they're eating that, all the old people are eating the fish, and everyone is getting drunk. We cut through, I think, four different songs between the two rooms before the plot continues. Yeah, this does go on for quite a while. Yep. It's, uh... This is where I'm looking. I'm watching this. I'm. I was thinking this is where it's all gonna go bad, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Uh, we will eventually see that uh, the professor and his wife are sitting out the festivities. They're just in a side room. They're not saying anything. And Shiro is hiding away in a storehouse because he just saw another two people die, and you know guilt gets to that guy. But eventually. Kinako goes looking for Shiro because she is wrecked drunk, and she finds him, and her suggestion is, I know what'll cheer you up. And we cut away. Yeah, it's it's, it's unclear exactly how much happened, but the, the intentions were known. And uh, they're both clothed when eventually Gozo goes looking for her and finds the two of them on the floor in the storehouse. I mean, would you really want to take your clothes off while lying down in there? I wouldn't. That's true. There's a lot of bottles in there. Nobody has cleaned yeah. that place up. But uh, this this escalates pretty quickly, and the two of them, <laughs> the two men are fighting, and Gozo is alternating between trying to kill his son and trying to kill his mistress, and eventually... He smacks her at the top of some steps, and she breaks her neck. So, of course, the move is, you didn't see shit, and we're both going back to this party, and everything's good, okay? Okay. Nothing happened. Yep. That's... That's kind of all that comes of this. Yeah, it nothing just, follows it kind of never, this up. It kind of never comes up again. It's just just yet another situation that he should have been able to stop, but he didn't. And as the two of them make their way back to the party, uh, the professor leaves professor and miss Yajima. They're walking out. She's not saying anything, just holding that pink umbrella. They say they're going to catch the final train home. It's late, you know, early enough. They can still do that. All right. Well, see you professor. Everyone's happy. And Every, then you know who else is happy, of course, mm-hmm. is uh, our new visitor who's just arrived at the festivities. And at the admin building, as someone screams out for sake, an old 
old woman comes up and goes, I've got a big jug. <laughs> Immediately, everyone is suspicious. Who are you? We've never seen you before. Oh, yeah, no, I'm just uh, just one of the loved ones of a former resident. Oh, okay, well, this isn't poison sake, is it? <laughs> Absolutely not. I'll take a drink with you. Let, go right ahead. Which, uh, and since we have uh, had the foreshadowing, we know it's it's, it's poisoned. And yep. she and is going she to drink care. it anyway. <laughs> she doesn't care. And she is singing... This is the one that is so on the nose. Everyone drinks of the poison. They will be dead by dawn. And she's singing it as she pours it. And I don't know if this is a traditional song, but I feel like I, I suspect everyone they made up, should know. I suspect they made up a few of these. Yeah. Just if that if that's not a traditional drinking song or some reference. Everyone should know better when she's singing that. Everyone takes their shot of wine. And this is when everything goes into turbo because Sachiko bursts in on all of these men and the one woman dying and goes, Oh no, the Yajimas threw themselves in front of a train. Also, Tamara's is there. And yeah, and he just appears in the shot his face is ghost white and he's still got the gun and even dying uh, shiro is just like oh no no what the fuck but unfortunately he does not have a chance of figuring out what the hell is going on sachiko takes the bullet and goes down and shiro runs over and the collapsing tamara falls into a chair, and he starts strangling Tamara. And at this point, Kyoichi's mother starts strangling Shiro and reveals herself. And this whole chain is following. And we cut back to the party in the main room, and all of them are dying from tainted fish. And a couple of them realize, but it's too late. All of them die immediately. Yep. It's it's just like the the worst fish, really. It's unbelievable. Yeah. To be fair, this is like a day after they caught them already dead, so yeah. I guess it makes sense. But just it's finally we see the clock strikes 9 and this pendulum on it just stops. And that is when everything goes dark around the three-way choke fiesta. <laughs> and we are in hell. Yep. We, uh, this is, uh, we didn't mention it, but uh, there was a quick shot at the start of the movie of mm -hmm. Shiro in hell. And it was, it was this. Uh, gorgeous um, lighting with the river Sanzu. Uh, filmed in negative. They process the film in reverse, so it's ghost white, and the sky is this mix of purples and blacks, and there's just a little bit of blue on Shiro at the edge of this frame. Yeah, I think the I think the sky might have just also been that river, but uh, color corrected quite differently. It's possible I was trying to tell they changed the lighting on the sky a few times in the scene. Yeah, there's they they ch they change a lot of things around in this part. <laughs> mhm. Mm and so Tamara appears in this version of the shot which we did not see at the start and he tells Shiro that a baby's cry is calling him, but we're going to go to hell together, buddy, and his face he's been really putting on the face this whole time, but in this scene with just the two of them inches apart zoomed in, he goes for it. He becomes a death mask here. <laughs> yeah, it, it is really in an incredible performance. At this point, it's kind of hard to start discussing linear time or any yeah. series of events because 
we are in hell and this is going wild. Linear time no longer exists. Um, there are some cutaways we'll probably mention as we go through, but one of them is just this shot of Shiro being thrown into a barbecue that is active and they get real close to it as they splice him onto it. Uh, it's a real good zoom, just like he's falling down into these circle of flames. And suddenly he is being hung on a spike before Lord Enma, the king of hell. I am Lord of the eight hells of fire and the eight hells of ice. I sit in judgment of all who slither into the underworld and pass sentence on their sins. And this is about where I realize that my complete lack of knowledge of Buddhism is not going to help me here. Because I don't um, I don't know how deep this digs into it or not. So some of Enma's narration is basically explaining to you what parts of Buddhism they are referencing, but you don't need it. it you could also just take it as window dressing on. I am explaining yeah, this procession of men is X. Yeah, it, it's co it's coherent without that knowledge. Well, as coherent as it can be. Um, yeah. So it's it's not like I was I was lost. Like I, or it, so it's not like I was lost or anything. It was just like I could I would probably get quite a bit more out of this if I knew more. Yeah. And so uh, we see a brief. Reminiscence on the many sins of Shiro, both that he has taken on himself and that he was directly responsible for. And Enma judges him guilty, and he is to drop into hell, so they just launch him down. Yep. And the next thing we see is children piling stones on a plane as a song plays... But eventually, Shiro takes form here and regains himself and starts pressing on because he hears the baby's cry. And this is when we find Yukiko, the actual Yukiko from the start of the film. So she confesses that she is here because she is also tied to that, and this is the bank of the river Sanzu, where children who leave the world before their parents are held. It's limbo. We're not in hell yet. But Shiro finally finds out that I have a daughter. And she died. And Yukiko, not knowing that she was about to have her dead lover appear, goes, Well, I couldn't, like, raise this child on my own in limbo. So I just sort of set her on a lotus leaf on the river, thinking that would take care of things, and you might want to go get her. Bye. <laughs> Bad plan, really. Uh, at one point, Terrible. she at one point she says, uh, "You should name our daughter." Actually, no, I'm going to name our daughter. It's Harumi. For the characters yep. for Spring and Beauty. Which you know the. It's a a, ni a nice and lovely name, and oh, by the way, you should go get her. Yep, and we just start to see him pursuing this baby, flying down the river, but it turns out Yukiko cannot follow because she cannot go into hell. This is not her place. And so at the edge of the river, she just collapses, and, uh, and she Shiro runs on. She asks him to put her grave next to his which i'm not i'm not sure how he's gonna do that yeah that line i also don't <laughs> that one i also feel like is a reference i'm not getting but enma shows us as uh we have shiro leaping further down into hell here yeah. meet the six paths of existence where the damned wander endlessly and there is just a procession in all directions of people shuffling through. And at this point, this is where every extra on the lot, since there were no more things to film, <laughs> just gets enlisted in the sequence where all they have to do is throw on some generic costumes, be filmed in blue light. And this whole sequence from here on takes place in an empty, barely lit studio with dirt on the floor. And that's it. Yep. And it's just, okay, now get in the line, 
walk over to about this spot and then just pick another direction and we'll just film it. Um, I do, I do think starting through this part, I was starting to think I kind of might have preferred it without the narration. Like it would it would be less comprehensible to me because he is ca- like King Enma is kind of explaining everything that's happening. Uh, but he's really explaining it. And I don't know, I just, I, I, I think I might have liked it a little more if it had just gone, like, full-on art house bullshit and just said, here's some images, make what you will of them. I do wonder if there's a version of this without that, especially because uh, Lord Enma's actor is uncredited in this, which, uh, so it might- if this were not put together as their final thing, I would say maybe it's a reshoot. Or just uh, af- after uh, people watched it, they they said we we need something more, and then added it, yeah. something like that. Yeah, it it does come off a little outside of things, especially because a lot of his dialogue starts to blend together in his um, explanations of a few punishments, <laughs> descriptions. Yeah. But we start running into various members of the cast here, and we see their sins and punishment. And the first is the professor and his wife. Finally, we find out what the professor did back in the war, and it's pretty cold. He stole the last of the water from a dying man's canteen to keep himself alive. Yeah, um, did this... This was also kind of unclear, like, did he, is it just he took the water and the other guy died of thirst, like, immediately? Which suggests that maybe even if he had the water, it wouldn't have done it. Um, Or did he, like, actually kill the man in order to do this? It it seems like he stole the water... So one of them could live, yeah. but he knew it was not his own. Uh, the, all of the imagery is of people crawling through sand, so it, it, that would follow that if that he uh, he just sort of left the other man to die. And so his hell for this is he starts crawling towards a draining oasis along with so many other people who thirst. And it's a really yeah. good shot from above as we just see all of them getting towards this murky water and then slowly the sand raises above it and it's just this dry pit that they keep crawling towards anyway really good shot and also and also not not to (laughs) start nitpicking uh jikoku the sinners of hell if the first two acts of the movie are in fact taking place in the real world or i guess maybe like a slightly augmented real world uh, why, how did Tamara get that photo? Who took, who took that photo? Uh, not, yeah, it, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It just, no, it, just it doesn't straight up doesn't. It's just, it, it is a thing there to, uh, it is deliberate. Like, I'm not trying to say like they screwed up or anything. Like it is clearly deliberate that, uh, they chose to have Tamara just ha- have knowledge that he shouldn't have of this other man's sins. Uh, it's just kind of another thing where it's just like, I'm not sure how I'm supposed to be interpreting the uh, the connections between the first parts of the film and this. Well, if you want to go full on bullshit with it. Okay. One line Tamara does throw around during the sequence is that he is a Shinigami, a god of death right before he is yanked away from playing the uh, Virgil to Shiro's Dante here <laughs> and is pulled into his own punishments. Yeah, that is so, that kind of knows? that kind of uh, seems to me like he was deliberately playing a part that yeah. he was not actually a real Shinigami. He was just a bad person. But I again, I don't really know yeah. the details of all of this. But yeah, the uh, the damned who 
committed a sin like this uh, will drink eternally of the pus and waste from their bodies. Yep. And they all march into this filthy looking ocean. I thought it was supposed to be the same river because it is the same shot. But I yeah. think I think there are a few different rivers represented here. And this one is the the pus wrung from from your festering carcasses and a cesspool of your foul wastes. Drink all you wish. Like, mm, that's po- probably the grossest thing in the movie. Especially when they zoom in and the colors are unpleasant. Yeah, it is brown and there's stuff in it. And they... Yep. I, I would not drink from that. Personally. No. Even if I was a sinner in hell. And so, at this point, because that's not what Shiro did... Shiro needs a way to get even further in his descent into hell. So the Yakuza's mother leaps on him and chokes him to double death. (laughs) Also, there's like it intercuts now and then of uh, the baby just sort of floating along. And I don't know. She seems like she's having a good time. The baby looks um, the baby looks like a tiny eraser head, by the way. Not the baby from (laughs) eraser head, but. The the lead with the way the hair is done? Yeah, it, it is kind of a weird hairdo, but what are you, what are you going to do? It's, Yukiko doesn't seem like a great parent, really. No, she she didn't really get any training in this. And so when Shiro appears again, he is on another level of hell, and there is just a procession of bodies all laying down still. And he finds Kyoichi, the Yakuza, again. And they both meet, and he begs for his forgiveness. And then we just cut, and both of them are suddenly skeletons on the ground. Everyone is skeletons. Just... We we found the skeleton closet. Yep. And we brought him out. And this is the first hell, and we start cutting through the sins and punishments of the various members of the Old Folks Administration. Uh, This is the first hell. Here, flesh is peeled, bones crushed, eyes plucked out, and limbs severed. Every time you make a sound, or even a whimper, you are returned to life to face the torments of hell again. Uh, The doctor gets a pretty metal one, because... He is sawed to pieces by a massive bone saw that we start first seeing where the marks have hit him. And then we see the prop come down on him as he screams. Yeah, I I was having I was having trouble figure like I was kind of losing track of all the people in this movie at this point. And I it, it just comes to an extreme close up of his face saying that he is the epitome of corruption I was not following, really. But. So we, we cut through three. It's the doctor first with the saw, uh, the cop next, and his hands are cut off from underneath the cuffs by one of the um, Oni. And we see a lot of actors in various different Oni face paint in this. It's pretty good. Uh, and then the director is the one where it's like, you were the most corrupt. He is sentenced to flaying, breaking yep. teeth, and then he is dismembered. Yeah, um, I, I have, I didn't know, I didn't really do a lot of research, uh, before we recorded this. But uh, one of the things that keeps coming up, and I don't know if it's true, but a bunch of people just say like this is the first movie, uh, the first gore film, which I, I don't know if that's actually true, but um, it, it, it is quite. Like, it looks pretty silly now, uh, now that we're sort of more used to seeing these things. And if you, it's 1960 in Japan, you're watching a movie. You don't expect a man to just become a giant pile of bloody flesh. Oh, yeah. And so you can probably get away with a lot more. It's not very realistic at all. Yeah, but. it has aged. Uh, you can see the budget and effects run out and show their age, but there are some shots like the heads of a few people sticking up from under sand where they are dragging 
the, what is supposed to be the flesh of the body off and you see ribs and organs and this yeah. mess from where they've been beaten those were those it's, were a lot better those shots yeah. were very very effective but yeah um i could see that argument just because 1960 would be before a lot of most of where i think that starts to my knowledge is Italian films, and that's the mid sixties. Yeah, the it- so. Sorry. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, just like yeah, that I could see this as a, as a starting point for that. Yeah. At least if you're going chronologically. And someone, someone in Italy saw this film and goes, "I can, I can do that in my film," and it all just kind of snowballs from there. Yeah, I know a butcher, and I got twenty bucks. Yeah. <laughs> And so at this point, Shiro continues wandering, and he finds his father and Kinako dwelling in the Lake of Blood, where lust and debauchery is punished. Yeah, there's just just some nude women. Yep. Just kind of, they're just kind of there, and then it just kind of moves on from that. Like I said, the the parts where it gets horny are just kind of strange. It's very weird because, again, it's not a movie that touches eroticism at all, but this is supposed to be punishment for lusts, and yet it's just bodies. Uh, But Tamara leads him on. He, uh, He has to follow him deeper because this is not where he's supposed to go. And Tamara is telling him, no cares or ties matter anymore. Just come with me. We'll have a great... We'll just go palling around hell, man. That's what we're here for. But no, he's he's still trying to follow the baby's cry. And we get a brief flash where there is a burning wheel and Yukiko is holding Harumi. But the flames rise and clearly Shiro doesn't make his way to either of them. There, that, um, I, I wonder if that is also tied in with the... Uh whatever was intended with the parasol imagery. It could be. And yeah, especially with the spinning, the cyclical nature reincarnation, maybe. Sure. I don't know. I am not an amazing Buddhist. I did not think to call my mother on this, who is actually a practicing Buddhist, but it would also be very weird in the middle of the week to go, hey, mom, can you (laughs) tell me about Buddhist hell in some detail? How many wheels are there? I have a movie for you to watch. Um... Can you can you give me a book report afterwards? For what it's worth, she is the person who bought me my copy of this years ago. Okay. So she so she probably has one. Yeah. Yeah, we we swap uh criterions around a lot in my family. <laughs> it's it starts doing a lot more super quick cuts of things here. Yeah, at this point my notes get very this is the next beat. This is the next beat. Um, <laughs> the painter is looking for his daughter. Uh, Shiro's mother and Sachiko are calling from him. We're in the field of glass where various cast members are trapped on spikes, held immobile. The spikes also look very good. The spikes through, through the feet. Yeah. That is quite upsetting to look at. Oh, yeah, just the feel. And Shiro, especially, the actor is like, we don't see a direct look at it, but he is dragging the lower part of his body and struggling against it to move any closer to Sachiko in this scene. Gotcha. Yeah. Um. And when we finally get out of another one of these visual scenes, it is Tamara who is urging Shiro to just give in take Sachiko and remain and the two of them embrace and before anything can happen their mother screams Luke Leia no your siblings <laughs> at, at some point so, uh, some point before this reveal uh somebody mentions uh I, I I didn't write this down very specifically somebody says that if they if they kiss or if if they consummate whatever their relationship is uh he will become the vermin of hell hell's vermin something like that uh, turns yes out, tur- uh, i believe it is tamara yeah, who says that turns out it's because it's his sister 
Yep. And so we get a long laid out bit where the reason Ito Shimizu is in hell is the fact that she had a child with Ensai. And that was Shiro. She went to Gozo pregnant with Shiro by Ensai. Never told him otherwise. And then... uh, This one, I don't know how, but apparently Ensai knocked her up again and she had the kid and gave it to whoever Ensai was with. And that was Sachiko. Because they're both... I, I, children of Ito. Okay, I I wasn't clear on like if they had different mothers or if it was like a half sibling thing. It, it's, so they do say a, a, Shiro was yeah. Ensai's son, and then Sachiko is Ito's daughter, and they don't explain how yeah. that happened. Again, they are kind of rushing through things by this point, so yeah, it, it, it's not surprising that we both lost track of some parts of it but at this point i think a part of me wonders if the sole reason that revelation comes up is just so you can have yukiko and sachiko on the screen at the same time and one can say shiro and one can say brother and then you can tell them apart that's a really good point yeah sachiko adjusts really quick to this like and, and yes. Almost as soon as the revelation hits her, she's just like, okay, Nissan. And immediately, this is when she's no longer trapped in hell. Because she starts getting the parasol imagery. Mm. She and Yukiko are just like above this. They can't be tortured anymore. All right. I did not catch that. Yeah, this is where you stop seeing them in the actual hell sequences they start appearing and like cheering him on they're not in any kind of pain so uh tamara gets his somewhere around here oh he gets his oh yeah and he's the okay i don't want to describe it in detail but over shiro's next so many journeys downwards he is getting Eyes attacked, ears pierced with needles, flesh rent, limbs removed, everything. His his punishment is all of them. Yes. Uh, I believe Enma says all of it. Every torment and torture and indignity. And so for Uh, a while, we just see him tortured while Shiro is running through wild scenes, like a field of limbs. (laughs) That's a, a, I, I wrote a sea of hands and feet. Heads! Yeah, eventually heads. <laughs> and um, th- then uh, this is the part where uh, they just get all of the centers of hell together, and they yes. just start running around in circles and screaming in some sort of, like, vortex of despair. The unending vortex, according to Enma. Uh, he, th- th- several of them are, like, wearing pillories, uh, around their necks, uh, which look on- honestly again, bringing this back to the real world, I'm surprised nobody hit anybody with one of them in any of the shots. It looks there's re- definitely some places where people are bumping into each other. It looks really dangerous, and so Shiro is stuck in this, trying to fight the tide, and. Eventually, the spinning crowd of humanity is cut back and forth between a wheel that the baby is on. Yes. Not this is not the, on fire yeah. this time. Not on fire, yeah. It's just a big ship's wheel, basically. Spokes and all. And Enma offers Shiro one chance. Save the baby, or she is also going to hell after riding down the river. And he keeps getting tossed off. He's trying to leap on. And the women of his family are screaming encouragement. They've got the parasols out. They're starting to lift up into heaven. But he eventually gets on and we just see him. And he's completely 
across from the baby, and the two of them at opposite ends, yin-yang. is dead on the other side of that baby, and he never gets any closer. Yep. And he's just screaming, horror me, horror me. And finally, this picture freezes like the clock, which we cut back to as we pan over the dead, eventually showing why Ensai was in hell too, because he finished his painting, and he threw down a lamp, setting the building on fire, and he hung himself. Yeah, I it it took me a while to connect um, with uh, Yukiko's mom. I was just like, why is she in hell? Did, did she just love her daughter too much? But uh, they did jump in front of a train, so I guess if suicide yeah, it's is... It's a suicide. That's why they're What's low. going to do yeah. it. it t- it's a kind of an embarrassingly long time for me to realize that. Yeah, that's why she's just in the wandering as opposed to her husband who gets the thirst forever. And... Um, so in in the in the room with all of the dead people, uh, Shiro and Sachiko are also doing kind of a yin yang thing with the mm-hmm. with their uh, heads, like they are lying down on the ground, sort of facing each other, uh, but uh, curled together. Yeah, and we we just finally see Sachiko and Yuchiko uh, just lotus petals falling as they lift into the sky and there's brightness and end yeah and then it just kind of stops it, it really does just cease on this shot that's it it's, i'm i i i guess it really it doesn't really matter if he gets to the baby or not and like leaving it ambiguous like it's it's all just sort of representations of things anyway it's not mm-hmm. especially at this part we are not in a literal story um but it just kind of didn't it didn't really feel like there was a resolution there i i it just just like the whole the whole ending just super rushed unfortunately which is a real yeah. shame because there was definitely a lot of interesting stuff that they were going for some re- some really cool imagery. Um, I liked I liked that shot of uh, him standing by the river a lot. Um, of yeah, the, it's the different it's exposures an unforgettable and unforgettable final half hour and change on this film. It, it's but it's sort of, it's every... unforgettable in the broad strokes, but I I think I feel like there are too many things happening too quickly to really sort of like keep it all in there i guess i feel Uh, like it's it's more like it it leaves you with a feeling and like a few specific shots that that hit you hard yeah uh the glass field will always stick with me especially for like i said shiro trying to yank (laughs) his body off of the spikes i i very much love this film it is it is art house. It is low soap opera. It merges all these worlds together into something that never drags. The slowest part is, as we called out, just the drinking and the revelry back and forth for a few rounds of songs. Like even that and wasn't really there, that long. It was. It just stood yeah. out compared to the rest of the movie. Yeah, because everything else is at a full gallop. After the hit and run, so yeah, I I really liked the first third of this. Just sort of the exploration of this poor sad sack who has just everything going wrong around him, and there's nothing he can do about it. Like the way that it did that with um you know some other weird things happening around it, but in general just. It's it's a it's like a it's really simple to start out with, and I thought it was like really compelling. Um, once we get into the old age home, it really did start to lose me a, a bit. Just um, there's they introduce so many characters, and I couldn't keep track of them. Um, 
there's so like you can, so much you can safely weird... cut the detective and the reporter yeah. without any issue or like yeah like the the detective trying to hit on sachiko just kind of just like a, an additional thing to just make you i guess not feel as bad when he dies mm -hmm. just uh like before everybody die well before all the named characters die we do get to find out like in general what what they did what it why they are or will be in hell yeah um tamara amazing whole way through yes like just uh, i i think the movie is worth watching like just for that performance it is so good it is so over the top but also like he stands out in each scene, but also like fits within them really well. And I'm not sure how they pulled that off, but they did. And I love it. Yeah. Um, There's no explanation given for how this guy is walking around in any Western version of this film. It would just be, oh, yeah. And the devil was there. But that's not a thing in <laughs> Buddhism. There's really not an explanation for him, even in Buddhism. But he's there and he's not leaving. And and then moving on to the final part, like I, I think I, I think I have made my feelings pretty clear. Like I enjoyed a lot of the imagery. The narration really was starting to drag. I would definitely like to see just a full art house bullshit version of that. Um and hmm. like it's uh, it just really felt kind of rushed by the end, I thought, but I'm and it it probably was almost definitely, especially if they were just completely running out of money. Um, And, you know, it's it's 2021. I'm seeing this movie for the first time in a different country. It hits different. And that's <laughs> that's just going to happen. Um. But I, I, I definitely did enjoy it, and uh, yeah, that, I guess that's all I have to say about Jigoku, The Sinners of Hell. And in doing research for this, uh, I found out there was a 1979 remake of this <laughs> for Toei yes. by a porno director. Yes. And uh, I, I'm going to start hunting for that because I want to know what... That take is. I would. It's got to be different. It's got to be different. I would assume just looking at the director's filmography, uh, it, this was probably like someone at Toei wanted to make a remake of Jigoku, uh, but they were not like the studio was not willing to put a lot of money into it, and so mm -hmm. they probably I. This is just, this could be totally wrong, but I assume they just went looking for a director who they could hire on the cheap, which does not mean that the movie is bad. It, it's entirely possible that it is a, a fantastic remake, but, um, let me. Oh, I just started looking up his, um, yeah. Okay. Looking at his filmography, that's definitely going to be different because I don't imagine that he took this in a very artistic direction I, it's given um it's entirely possible I, d I don't want to judge the quality of the movie or anything uh sorry i'm trying to pull up uh the list again because it is kind of amazing uh it, it's a couple after wet lust opening the tulip and a few before pleasure campus secret games like, I'm not saying that the director of Female Hell, The Moist Forest, a.k.a. Woods Are Wet Woman Hell, did not want to make a great film. Do I think it's likely to be great? No. But you never know, I guess. I'm just saying that Criterion has worked with Toei. And they will occasionally put a remake or other things by a director as extras on a disc. Mm. And the uh, the Kumashiro remake of Jigoku is not on my disc. Okay. 
I did not actually know that they would just include a remake. That's interesting. Uh, it's it's definitely happened sometimes. They'll they'll include some very wild extras at times, especially if it's a multi disc set. Will they include Moist Desires, the Open Tulip, aka Wet Lust, opening the tulip? All of these movies have two names, and they're both imp- impressive. I, I like to think it means that some of these did come to the West in some form. And you know what? Good on you, Kumashiro. Hey, he, he, he made the money and he got to remake a classic film. So, yep. It all works out. But, uh, yeah, that, that was Jigoku, or The Sinners of Hell. And with that, my time as host is over. What do you have for me next week? Okay. Um, before that, I'm sorry. I just remembered something else very important. Um, okay. Before, just before we move on, uh, I have one final thing to read here. Uh, it is a mm-hmm. review of G. Goku, The Sinners of Hell, from prolific IMDb uh, critic, J- Jacob John Taylor one, which just really tickled me. Mm-hmm. Uh, why did this get a 6.9? The storyline is awful. The acting is awful. It is not scary. Do not know why people like this movie. 6.9 is just overrating this pile of poo-poo. Uh, poo with an H, by the way. And it did <laughs> just an important detail. Um... I give it one out of ten because it is a big pile of poo. Do not see this movie. It is awful. Do not see it. The people who made it have no talent. It just a stinky poo-poo movie. (laughs) The the ending is awful. It is very slow. There is no point to this awful movie. I do not why people like it. It is a big pile of poo-poo. Do not waste your time. Do not waste your money. Do not see this awful movie. You have been warned. This not scary. This just poo-poo in the toilet. Sinners in the toilet. That is what they should have called it. (laughs) Do not see this movie. It is one of the worst Ah. horror films ever. (laughs) I looked through this guy. You know what? That was a good capstone. I looked through this guy's Ah. other reviews. Uh, I think this is real. I I think he's just like this. He did did eventually learn how to spell poo-poo, though. Oh, good. So yeah, thank you for sharing this stinky poo poo movie with me. Um, <laughs> uh, Sinners in the toilet. Next Friday, uh, the movie that I have chosen. So I thought we started with a movie from 2007 and then jumped straight to 1960. Mm-hmm. So why not look for something dead in the middle of that? And that is 1983. Uh, the movie is called The Prey. I presume spelled with an E? P-R-E-Y, yes. Okay. Um, This one caught my attention on the list, uh, which, by the way, 1983, like, kind of a banner year for horror, apparently. I noticed several um, Stephen King adaptations in there. This is not one of them. Wasn't that Creepshow? Uh, Creepshow, I think. uh, Christine, definitely. Mm Mm-hmm. But this one caught my attention because um, the poster for the movie, the tagline just says, it's not human and it's got an axe. Which is just delightful. Um, I am looking at this poster now and this rules. (laughs) Uh, This could go either way. So I didn't look up any professional critic reviews or anything. Uh, so this might be like the worst thing we've ever seen. I don't know. Uh, it, the Amazon review aggregate says about four and a half out of five. And the IMDB review aggregate says about four and a half out of ten. Hmm. Um, so the plot description uh Three couples go on a camping trip in the woods of Southern California during the summer, where a deformed man is stalking their camp. Hmm. Uh, so... It's go- going to be quite a bit lower brow than the one that you chose. I promise I'm not just going to pick all the trash. 
Uh, I promise I'm not only going to pick art films. So we we love all movies here. Well, not all. We love most movies here. We love a variety of movies here. Uh, if you want to watch it for yourself, uh, it is available for streaming on Tubi, uh, the Fox joint. Yes. Uh, it is also, uh, it's free with ads on there. It is also free with ads on a Fandor, which apparently has relaunched. And their website, like, it's awful. But it's there <laughs> if you prefer that. You, it's also available for rent. Uh, it's like a dollar on Amazon or two dollars on YouTube. Basically, if you want to watch 1983's The Prey on the internet, there's options. Nice. And we will see you then. We'll see you next time. Bye.